It's early morning in North Dumfries Township, in the heart of South Central Ontario. Over seven centuries ago, the Iroquois people grew corn on these lands. It's been less than 200 years since the first European settlers began farming here. In the township village of Ayr, folks are beginning another day. On Stanley Street, Jimmy Patterson opens his hardware store, just as he has for the past 47 years. Over at the coffee shop, the talk is about the usual, the weather and the crops. Villages are special places. For some of us, they are the places of our youth, where we were born, came of age, and then left behind. For others, Villages are the stuff of dreams, idealized worlds that appeal to a longing for community and serenity. For the people of Ayr, this village is a place called home. In 1824, Abel Mudge arrived at the junction of the Nith River and Cedar Creek. He liked what he saw and settled there. Mudge's Mills later became the village of Ayr, named for the large number of settlers from Ayrshire, Scotland. Today, Ayr is a farm supply and service community. Ayr's handsome pioneer homes attest to its earlier days as a prosperous milling and manufacturing center. Reminders of bygone days can still be seen as in this elaborate cast iron horse hitch. As in most villages, the pace of life still allows time for a neighborly chat. By the late 1800s, the residents of Ayr were proud of their achievements. They had built three churches, two hotels, a score of small businesses, a library, and a fire company. And to keep the demon rum at bay, there was the Blue Ribbon Temperance Society. Back in 1916, an article that appeared in Every Woman's World declared, Air has accomplished a number of things, which would be a credit to many a larger place. Recognizing that the interest of village and farm were the same, they developed a broad community spirit. Today, that community spirit is still alive.
At 90, Jimmy Patterson is Ayr's oldest businessman. He came to the village in 1919. Business goes on just about the same as what it did 30 years ago, only we're into different, uh, a little different merchandise, that's all. It's a good business to be in, meeting people and uh, enjoying uh, a chat with them once in a while. And uh, you find out a lot about a person, and you find out from a, a little kid uh, where uh, a lot of the fun comes in. They'll tell you things about a, their father and mother that uh, <laughs> they shouldn't sometimes. Uh, when I went to school, first, second teacher I had was a lady, and they didn't get very much wages, but they, she gave us, I think, she gave us all a, a postcard. Postcards were just new about that time. And uh, she had a, a verse. Uh, and uh, the one that was on my card uh, was, and I don't mind just what the picture was, but uh, on the back was a, a verse. Do all the good you can, in all the ways you can, just as long as you can, to all the people you can. And I tried to live up to that. During the 1800s, this factory was known around the world. It was built in 1847 by John Watson, a Scottish iron founder. Agricultural historian Peter Ledwith. Before he started out with uh, stoves and, and cast iron cooking ware, but very quickly branched into farm machinery. And he, he was very famous for such things as grain harvesters. Uh, earlier, they were the reapers. But it seems that it was the harvesting machinery that really brought them to the forefront. Uh, their hummingbird mower used for cutting hay in the field. And uh, the 1870s and 80s was a uh, time period when innumerable inventions and farm machines that were truly lessened the workload of the farmer. He sold internationally and won prizes on an international level for his products. Uh, he was winning prizes in France in the 1870s. only Canadian to win a prize at, at an, a widely acclaimed American farm machinery show. So yes, indeed, not only was he able to produce a good product, but he was able to, to sell it, he was able to merchandise it, and able to win trophies on an international market, which brought him uh, all kinds of acclaim. Watson was at the pinnacle of his success. In 1882, he built an enormous new factory. At the time, it was heralded as the largest and best equipped plant in Canada. Watson's men were a loyal group, and his thoughtfulness cemented that loyalty. On many an overtime shift, he would appear bearing a basket and a jug of coffee. He enjoyed their company and would join them in a good story or two. But I think it's perhaps interesting to know, not only was he uh, acclaimed internationally and at the forefront of the Canadian industry, he was very much an air man. He was involved in his local community uh, as many of the big men in, the, in that industry were at the time. The Masseys were very involved in Toronto. Watson was very involved with Ayr. He was uh, on town council. He was one of the first magistrates of the town of Ayr. So although he went beyond the borders to, to sell his products, he, he remained very much an Ayr man, and his heart was here. John Watson died in 1903. His three sons continued to run the factory. But by the turn of the century, its national importance had been eclipsed by the giant Massey Harris Company. The Watson factory no longer makes farm machinery. In the 1920s, they switched to producing different types of industrial hand carts, something they still make.
Bill Scott raises beef cattle on a farm just outside Ayr. His roots go back four generations. His great-grandfather homesteaded here in 1838. This little village offers a farmer pretty much everything he needs. He's got uh, good hardware uh, supplies in the stores. He's got two feed mills that do an excellent job at the top end with feed and fertilizer and, and uh, sprays. I would say that uh, the village of Air certainly means more to me than just a place to do business. It's, it's home to me, Barry. And uh, it has always, uh, things that have impressed me since I was a boy, and especially maybe in the, in the sports uh, end of it, uh, both my wife and I, are very fond of sports and are very involved in sports. Air has always been a sporting village. The Union Curling Club was one of the first in Ontario. And Wayne Gretzky might never have become a superstar had it not been for an air invention, the modern hockey stick. I've told a lot of people I had uh, three years hockey in another town and I didn't know what it was like to have fun playing hockey until I came to this village. They used to kid us that uh, when we were out of town playing hockey, why you could uh, rob this village blind because there was nobody home to watch it. In the village, on any given afternoon, you can find in Tony's back room a sport of another kind. The, the boys get in there and they, uh, they truly do enjoy it. And I think that's all part of a great village when you can have a hangout like that. And this village has got a lot of good people in it that seem to be able to plan and make things happen. They can still get together where maybe it's because it's small and uh, we don't have as much uh, bickering back and forth. This is a pretty nice little spot. I love what I do. I love animals. I learned at an early age that uh, the better that you do with your farmland, the more animals you can keep. Uh, I would like to certainly think that I have followed my father's footsteps and how he felt about the village of Air, and I, I have these three sons that I know are going to feel the same way. Here, this is home to them too. And someday they'll put me up on Boot Hill there, and that'll be all right too because my mother and father and uh, my grandparents and great grandparents are up there. Bill Scott's great-grandfather would have shared the sentiments of a fellow homesteader who, in a letter home to Scotland in 1841, wrote, Dear father and mother, the farm is a very healthy place and is within three miles of the church and about one and a half from two grist mills and a distillery, two stores and a post office. The name of it is Ayr. We expect it to be a large village soon. There are a great many people from Ayrshire settled around about it. By this you will know that we do not live in the wilds of America. We can raise almost anything here in the fields. Cucumbers, musk melons, pumpkins, squashes, onions, carrots grow well, and parsnips, turnips, French beans and white peas and Indian corn. This is a beautiful country. I think it was a good change for me. I wish you were here to see my place. I think you would think something of it.
Today's farm machinery would have astonished our pioneer farmer. Not to mention John Watson with his hummingbird moor. The beef and dairy farms that surround air are some of the best in Canada. Their cattle regularly win top awards at the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair held each year in Toronto. And at a 4-H club meeting, a new generation of air farmers. Many of these young people will continue to work on the family farm, just as their parents and grandparents before them. And so a tradition will continue that has encouraged a sense of pride and community that has always been felt here. The word farm has a deceptively simple meaning, attractive land used for raising crops or animals. But this dry definition fails to capture the real substance of farming. I grew up on a farm, and I know what farming means to people. It is not just another job, it is a way of life. The soil is the very basis of the farmer's existence. And for many, the land forms an unbroken link between one generation and the next. It's late afternoon in North Dumfries Township, and the day is winding down. In air, it's a time to put the day's concerns aside. This summer evening brings friends together catch up on the news, and to reminisce about other times.
Years ago, a former resident of the village remembered back to 1899 when he was 10 and living in air. This Sunday evening in June was a beautifully clear and calm one, and as if in accordance with the Sabbath, a peace seemed to rest on the locality. But within a few days, our family was leaving beloved air. I was cast down at the unthinkable prospect. I sauntered down William Street and reflected on all I was being removed from. The lovely Nith River. We knew every twist and turn, from Kelly's Hole, our swimming spot, to the gully where Oscar and I had built a raft. The cows pasturing on Watson's Flats, I knew everyone by name. I would miss hearing Mrs. Tunney and Mrs. Innes coming down at milking time to call them. This reverie was suddenly interrupted by one of the most pleasant memories of air. It was as if the whole atmosphere was charged with the most entrancing music, sent as if to soothe my troubled mind. As if prearranged, the choirs of air's three churches burst into song simultaneously. The harmony and beauty of the singing floating through the open church windows, carrying across the space and down to me with unusual clearness. It was magnificent. <laughs> 